Welcome back. Louise Brooks is not often remembered, but then again, she was quite rebellious and basically got herself kicked out of early Hollywood for refusing to bend to the studio's will. So, in other words, there was some intentional forgetting on some people's part. Yeah. Now, we could begin this episode with a list of her escapades, or we could quote her reasons for never writing a biography. As she said, In writing The History of a Life, I believe absolutely that the reader cannot understand the character and deeds of the subject unless he is given a basic understanding of that person's sexual loves and hates and conflicts. I, too, am unwilling to write the sexual truth that would make my life worth reading. I cannot unbuckle the Bible belt. That is why I will never write my memoirs. So if you're listening from the southern USA, can we count this podcast as wriggling out part of that belt? I mean, I think we can, but (laughs) would love to hear from those southerners. Anyway, we begin in Cherryvale, Kansas, in November 1906. Louise's mother was not typical of maternal figures of the time. She left her four children to their own devices in favor of being a pianist. Though she would not perform publicly, aside from bridal parties in the town. When Louise went to tell her mother that she'd dropped a cup on the floor and it shattered, her mother's response was, Now, dear, don't bother me when I'm memorizing Bach. Okay, so yeah, that's not your stereotypical mother over there. As for our protagonist, Louise wanted to be a dancer. In fact, she started dancing at the age of four in church benefit performances. By ten, she was performing at fairs, in theaters, and at hobby clubs. It's also about this time that her braids were cut into the bob we all see in photos of her. This is not to say that all was well. You'd think that in small-town Kansas of pre-World War I, that small children would be fine on their own. Sadly, Louise at age nine was molested by a 45-year-old neighbor after her curiosity over him giving out candy got the better of her, and she entered his house rather than running away. By 1920, when she was 14, her family moved to Wichita. Unfortunately, she now ran into a Mr. Vincent, who replaced the man in Cherryvale, and who would do photo modeling sessions with her, which were only sometimes chaperoned due to schedules. Far more innocent were her dances and flirting with boys her own age at school. Well, at least she has some opportunity to hang out with people her own age after what must have been a very traumatizing otherwise experience with the male gender. You would think. Then the Ted Sean and Ruth St. Dennis Dance Company came to Wichita in the fall of 1921. Those of you who are more familiar with Ever Palmer, who has also been on our podcast as a subject, Ted Sean actually is inspired by her dances. So it's all connected. It's all connected! Get out your red string! Louise and her mother met Sean, who offered our protagonist a place at his school. It took six months of nagging her to get him to pay the $300 for her enrollment, and then she was off to New York City at age 15, albeit with a chaperone. Training was rigorous and left little time to take in Broadway shows, let alone for her to participate in other nightlife. After graduation, her chaperone left for Kansas, and Louise joined the Dennis Sean Dance Company on tour. Touring proved to have the same exhaustion as training. Like the others, Louise lived out of a suitcase and two tins of makeup. The reviews were not helpful, as serious dance was in its infancy. Newspapers would send sports critics to cover the dances because they figured it was closer to athletics than theater. 
Oh boy. So yeah, that really is, uh, <laughs> they're not ready for dance yet. No, no, they are not. In fact, one guy thought the famous dancer Isidore Duncan was two people in his report, Isidore and Mrs. Duncan. No. Well, I guess this she's part of the cutting edge. For a time. Another problem was that Louise was quite flirty when there was time for admirers. Now, the dance company had a policy prohibiting smoking, drinking, and sexual immorality. This contributed to her abrupt dismissal from the company at age 17. Wow, she is already getting into situations. The other contributing factor was the friction between her and Ruth St. Dennis over the fact Louise was already a bit of a wild child. It amounted to a firing based on a bad culture fit. As Louise herself said later in life, I have a gift for enraging people. At this point in time, through her frustrated tears back in her apartment, she repeated, I won't go back to Kansas. So Dorothy, she was not. No, quite the opposite. Now, still wanting to dance, Louise managed to get a job through a friend at the George White Scandals. Okay, so that sounds like more of an apropos workplace for her. Yes, she was now a chorus girl showing off her legs. The scandals were initially modeled on the Follies, but the shows gained a reputation for being less opulent and faster and younger. She quickly gained both a small notice in the papers and the hatred of the rest of the chorus line. The hatred was partly due to the fact that Louise was the only trained dancer at the scandals during this time. So I guess this shows that we are at the beginning of serious dance, where you can either be, like, well-known and lauded for being sexy dancing, um, or in obscurity for actually taking it seriously. But no one expects you to do both of those things. Very true. We are also not that far ahead of the time when... Oh, what's the famous dance show from Russia that shut down Paris? Oh, man, I know what you're talking about. Ah, you just say the Russians. Leave people to wonder about it. I don't know, because it's not coming to me. The Russians. We we <laughs> did an episode on this. I know both our minds are blanking, so moving on. Back to Louise, there were also instances of her showing up late to rehearsal which resulted in fewer reprimands because she was the golden child of the moment for the show. More importantly for our story, it's during this job that she stumbles across film scouts. Oh, and that's how people get pictures of her and we start seeing a Wikipedia page and (laughs) she becomes known to us now. Louise spent more time out at restaurants and enjoying other nightlife now. One night, a man asked her if she wanted to come over to Astoria on Long Island and do a screen test for Paramount. Uh Uh-huh, mm-hmm, right, sure. No, this time that's actually a thing. Mm Mm-hmm. That's not just to come online. Uh Uh-huh. Now, every chorus girl had been warned about never having anything to do with a man who talked about a screen test. But a screen test was also the goal of every Broadway girl at the time, except for Louise. She said no. Why? What's not to like about it? Louise was a dancer. Fair enough. She already knew what she wanted to do. But as you probably guessed, that wasn't the end of it. She frequented parties where girls would go off into bedrooms with film guys and come out with a ticket to Hollywood. But she still doesn't stumble off to Hollywood like that. Instead, she quits the scandals with no notice on an emergency passport to join her friend who'd been shipped off to private school in France. Okay, sudden left turn. Um, what are we doing in France? Not much, because we very quickly end up in England for a few months. And while there, she has a brief engagement to the owner of a cafe. 
So when you say engagement, do you mean like they were engaged in a relationship or do you mean engagement? The second choice. After a few months. Okay, Louise. She's a woman of very sudden left turns. I guess. So is... Does, do they get married? No, she returns to the U.S. and joins the Ziegfeld Follies at the start of 1925 instead. Okay. More power to her. More mentions in newspaper reviews followed. Now, several Follies chorus girls had been poached by film scouts at this point, but Louise still didn't care. She thought the movies were intrinsically lesser than the theater. However, she still did a screen test, perhaps out of boredom. It probably helped that the scout showered her with presents and was besotted with her. And this is how she came to do the film The Street of Forgotten Men in 1925. Louise decided she did terribly. Everyone else thought the opposite. Both Paramount and Metro wanted her to act for them. Against advice, she accepted Paramount's deal. Years later, when someone asked why she went into movies, she answered, To make money, to make money, to live for God's sake. <laughs> I love it. She is, she is resisting the ideas that a lot of people have put forth about the sanctity of film and the power of the moving picture. Well, there was no sanctity at the beginning of the film industry. Mm -hmm. Sanctity, sainthood, anointing with holy oil, whatever metaphor you wish to use here, that doesn't come until there's some new upstart industry or whatever, like video games. Mm -hmm. Right, 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 right. No, we're, we're at a point where this is the, um, the video games of the time. Louise was put to work immediately. In fact, she made six films in 1926. Yet she had time to have a brief fling of two months with Charlie Chaplin in New York before all that started. With Charlie Chaplin? I was not expecting him to come up. Yeah, and weirdly, soon after, he sent her a check in the mail as a sort of thanks for the memories, and then they never saw each other again. More interesting, Louise's rise was perfectly timed with the flapper era. You probably see her bob haircut as emblematic of the era. This didn't mean she was happy with the changes in her life. On set, she disliked her acting, the makeup, the costumes, and her co-star's acting. She called one a tyrant for demanding the director invent a frame with light bulbs for close-ups, a result that also ensured that everyone could see through her makeup in shots with the device. Oh, no. And you do hear about, at that time specifically, and also in general, uh, women, female stars were very concerned about how they were lit. Yes, because by the time you were 23 or 25, it was thought you looked too old on screen. Yeah, it was a different time. By this point, the film scouts were also done with her and had moved on to openly obsessing over Joan Crawford. Louise also thought that the whole idea of the flapper only existed in the writer F. Scott Fitzgerald's mind and the antics he'd planted into his wife Zelda's head. Wow, so kind of the manic pixie dream girl at the time, in her view. Very. Now, it is during this time that she gets married to Eddie Sutherland, a director at Paramount. In fact, he directed one of Louise's 1926 films, It's an Old Army Game, a silent comedy that seems to be about an unrequited love triangle. Before the film ended, he was talking about marriage, which our 19-year-old protagonist laughed off. Oh my god, she's still 19? Yes. How's she done so much? She just runs through things very quickly, and because she can land on her feet and is attractive, flirty, and very extroverted at times, people like her, so they give her more opportunities. I guess. So she laughs him off. 
and then he chases after her, blowing up her phone after their fling during filming ended. Oh, not creepy at all. And a rather odd occurrence for a playboy who got divorced easily and would marry multiple times to several actresses. Or maybe not odd in that light. And so they ended up married a few months later. No! I can already hear it. You're wondering why the about face? Well, she didn't love him, but she did like his style and the excitement that surrounded him. Still, cracks in the union started to show almost immediately. He loved people. She liked solitude. He loved Hollywood. She only somewhat managed to tolerate it. It was not a good combo. They also never exactly went on a honeymoon. In fact, she just kept filming more movies for Paramount and then Eddie would be called away to direct. So in six months, they spent only ten days together. And then at one point when she arrived back in Hollywood, he wasn't there to meet her. He said he was off shooting a film, but there's doubts about this. Yeah, so this sounds like a a very great relationship that started on some strong foundations and uh, continues to be quite solid based on the mutual care and uh, each person working to meet the other halfway. Sarcasm much? Yeah. I don't think it's surprising that they then got divorced in 1928, especially as they both had flings with other people. As Louise would put it, Love is a publicity stunt, and making love, after the first curious rapture, is only another petulant way to pass the time waiting for the studio to call. Dang, that's cynical. (laughs) But I feel like that describes multiple other relationships we've seen in the course of this series. It was going downhill after that. Louise still made movies and had flings, but she'd also get men like Harvey Perry, another actor, asking her things like, Everybody knows you're that high-level executive's girl, and he has syphilis. And what I want to know is, do you have syphilis? And he asked her this in a room full of people. Okay, so he's not just, like, checking out a prospective partner and making sure that, you know, he's not going to get anything from her. He is trying to badmouth her. Oh yeah, naturally, she was silent for a moment, probably thinking what the fuck. So he continued to say, Another reason I want to know is that my girl is coming up at noon to drive me back to Hollywood from the party. Some people have no tact. In fact, he apparently meant this as a performance because he glanced around the room at everyone to gauge the reactions as Louise ran horrified and humiliated from said room. Mm Mm-hmm. So it sounds like he was a great guy. On the film side, though, things were a bit better. She got a lead role in Beggars of Life, which was her first and favorite androgynous role as she was disguised as a homeless boy. Still, she didn't get on with co-stars, partly because one was a friend of her soon-to-be ex-husband. Oh, that really would change the atmosphere. Thereafter followed Louise's worst fear, boredom. So she got an invite to spend New Year's of 1927 to 1928 at William Randolph Hearst's mansion. It's there she meets and becomes friends with Peppy Lederer, the niece of the actress mistress of Hearst, who you probably know as Marion Davies. While the divorce was not through yet, as Louise and Eddie would be married till sometime in 1928, Louise started sexually experimenting a bit with Peppy. Oh? Now I know what question you're going to ask. No. Louise was not bi. No? She didn't believe in bisexuality. However, she was aware that women chased after her along with men. As she put it, From the age of 15, I was pursued by lesbians, and I was strongly attracted by them, but not much sexually. While in the Follies, I lived with Peggy Fears, who had already become a lesbian legend, running through the Follies beauties like the well-known dose of salts. Every man in New York was jealous of her conquests. How this tickled her. 
Louise herself maintained she only experimented thrice, including with Greta Garbo. But she let rumors that she was gay spread. Honestly, hashtag icon, hashtag ally, this is beautiful. Do you got something to say about that? <laughs> Just that it's funny you say that because I can hear someone somewhere screaming by erasure because like- she didn't believe in it. I mean, you know, too bad for her. And, you know, this was before we had the type of communities that we have now. And and obviously they had some great subcultural communities then. But, you know, people had weird ideas about bisexuality. That's fine. It sounds like she may not have been bi. She might have just been, you know, fine with it. And that's cool, too. We're not going to cancel her. It's been It's been a decade or two since she was alive. Now Louise's next Hollywood film was The Canary Murder Case in 1929. I don't bring it up for the story. Instead, it's because Louise booked it to Europe after filming this. In fact, she told Hollywood and Paramount to go to hell when they asked her to reshoot it for a sound version. Was this just a particularly grueling shoot, or did she have some other, like, was she just really tired after it? She just didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And her refusal is why the dubbing is so bad. And it would come back to bite her in the ass because I really doubt whether or not the public knew that the terrible voice dubbing wasn't her. So being very dissatisfied with Hollywood, with her life in general, just not wanting to do this stuff, Louise does what she has always done. She goes to Europe following a former lover and friend to the European film circles. There is also now the rumor that Paramount executives retaliated by releasing a statement or rumor that her voice did not record well. Shades of John Gilbert here. And this is how we come to Pabst, who is making an adaptation of a play called Pandora's Box and its protagonist, Lulu. As you may recall from a previous episode, Paps turned down Marlena Dietrich for the role. He said Dietrich was too obvious for it, and one look from her would turn the film into a burlesque. Basically, she couldn't play innocent as well for several scenes as Brooks could. Now, the plot is of the mistress of a middle-aged newspaper publisher and how her lifestyle leads her from the world of glamour to a squalid London flat and being killed by Jack the Ripper on her first day as a streetwalker. This in a world with a theme that the folly of men and envy of women unleashed evil on the world, rather than Pandora's curiosity, if you know the original myth. You may be asking yourself how Louise got this role. Yeah, how did Louise get this role? She actually had a film star's greeting in Berlin, with paparazzi. So she was known and Pabst wanted her for the role. She accepted, and the rest is history. Without going into too much detail about the film, filming took place over five weeks with a few hiccups. Also, side note, there were actors from five countries all working on this silent picture, and Pabst directed them all in their native languages. That's impressive. It came in handy with an actress who got upset that she was briefly playing a lesbian opposite Brooks in one scene. Oh no, playing a lesbian, whatever will you do? She walked off in a huff. Paps talked to her. She came back and did the scene perfectly. Can you guess why? He said, actually, women are really attractive. Have you thought about it? No. Paps told her to look over Louise's shoulder in each shot and play the scene to him as if he was the love interest and not the woman she happened to be dancing with. At other times, he let her displeasure over this show because her character was supposed to be jealous at Lulu's wedding. Louise thought it looked marvelous because she looked like a very repressed lesbian who was hiding it. Ooh, so it has a little dimension to that. Now, I do wonder, when the woman was cast, did she not realize that her role was a lesbian? No, uh, no one told this French woman until she showed up on set that day. 
That, I think, is a problem with the industry then, too. Now, Louise would still be amused, though bewildered decades later, to discover that the public could believe an actress's private life to be like one role in one film. In that scenario, she laughed astonished when a French boy, after seeing Pandora's box, spoke as if she was a real-life lesbian. When she asked, he said, but of course. (laughs) Right, because everything that we see in movies is the actual literal truth. And when you see a dragon or a spaceship in a movie, that's a documentary that really happened. I will say, even if some of the surprises feigned in that case, Louise does bring up an interesting point about people assuming or wishing an actress is gay because she plays a lesbian so well on screen. As to her and Pabst working, they got on well, and he was ecstatic to find out about her dance training. She was less amused when he would destroy some of her clothes to get her to sob in a scene. I can't believe that this is such an old thing. Like, I'm sure that you've heard the stories of, like, Kubrick and The Shining or, you know, various directors throughout time not trusting their actresses, and specifically actresses, to act. And so doing things to cause them real fear or real pain. Honestly, I'm not surprised it goes back to the beginning of film. I'd be surprised if it started later. Mm -hmm. Well, because you think like, oh, you know, that might have come with the method in that sense of like, you have to feel the real feelings. But no, you're you're absolutely right. Misogyny is eternal. (laughs) That said, the film was a success and launched her into stardom. As one later historian exclaimed, there is no Garbo, there is no Dietrich, there is only Louise Brooks. Yet, her style of acting was considered odd by some. The film industry still relied frequently on stage techniques, which look disjointed to us today, which is why we can watch Pandora's Box and see nothing odd with Louise's acting. Oh, so she was ahead of her time. She went on to do another film with Paps, Diary of a Lost Girl. It's a dark film about the daughter of a pharmacist who gets pregnant via rape by her father's assistant and then refuses to marry her attacker. So her relatives give the baby to a midwife and force her into a a reformatory for wayward girls. The baby dies. She gets out of the reformatory and ends up a prostitute after her father doesn't acknowledge or help her. Then again, he got in the family maid pregnant before said maid threw herself off a bridge at the beginning of the film, so not the best morals there. The film ends with Louise's character inheriting some money, leaving the brothel, and marrying a supposed count as cover before becoming head of the reformatory, only to run off with her friend who shows up back there as a difficult case at the end. Unfortunately, the film released at a bad time. Oh, wait, sorry, I was going to say something. Um, first of all, what a bonkers plot. Second of all, that sounds uh, <laughs> pre-code. It is indeed pre-code. It's also European, and it is also a silent at the cusp of the talky era. People didn't like its frankness, and the censors cutting off parts of the film didn't help. I imagine cutting anything that would be distasteful would also cut, like, major elements of the story, so I could see how there would be some problems here. It was also never released in the U.S., which is probably just as well. I imagine the church ladies would throw a fit, and their husbands would turn into giant caricatures of strawberries if they had seen it. Louise stayed in Europe a bit longer after this, and made one more film. But then she sailed back to the States. At 23, she was at the height of her fame and success. She's still only 23, oh my god! And she didn't know that her last European film would also be her last starring role. What, because she aged out of the business? No, upon returning to Hollywood, Louise discovered she'd been blacklisted after telling Paramount to F off and refusing to be part of the dubbing for the Canary murder case. She did get a few roles, but none of them were good. Equally unfortunate was that she was trying to keep up with rich friends, and ended up bankrupt as a result in 1932. 
The press blared headlines about it. This was a rather quick turnaround, similar to when people win the lottery and then go broke. It didn't stop her from hanging out in these circles, which is how she met a Chicago playboy and polo player, Deering Davis, who was a very good dancer, according to her. And you know he's got money if he has two last names. I think Deering might have been his first name. Now that's what I'm saying. If, if, if a guy's first name is a last name, he's got that money. Anyway... Louise married Deering Davis in 1933, but she left him five months later and never saw him again. I, I'm wondering if this is a pattern for her. It rather is. According to some, Davis had just been another well-heeled admirer of hers. As film roles dwindled, Louise returned to dancing. She got work in a touring duo dance act. It only lasted through mid-1935, when the original woman in the act returned after getting married. Her last film came out in 1938, a western with the soon-to-be rising star John Wayne. Okay, so that's pretty big. She didn't get any offers. And even if someone had offered, she was too tired and humiliated to take it. You see, all those last films didn't do well. The studio was still punishing her for refusing to do that dubbing a decade before. Love that studio system. By 1940, a friend advised her to leave Hollywood, or she'd probably end up a call girl. Disgusted, depressed, and almost destitute, Louise took a train to Wichita and moved in with her parents. Hashtag relatable. She tried her hand at dance exhibitions and dance teaching here and there during this time. At one point, she was even a partner in a dance studio, but she didn't like being back in Kansas. After the studio failed, Louise went to New York City. There, she bounced around with radio stints, writing for a gossip column, and working as a sales girl for Saks Fifth Avenue stores. Nothing took. She was fired frequently. Louise ended up kind of following the downward trend of Lulu minus Jack the Ripper. Oh, at least she, she avoided this. Sorry. At least she avoided the serial killer. But she still became a high end escort. Thus followed a good decade or so of boozing and whoring into oblivion until someone rediscovered her films. In fact, there was a Louise Brooks Film Festival in 1957. So naturally, someone figured out where she lived and started bugging her. Which in this case was a good thing. Don't try that with Garbo, though. You'd probably get horrified looks from beyond the grave. So now Louise pulled herself out of an alcoholic heap, quit drinking, and started writing. Her true second career in her 50s. She penned film essays and, very rarely, gave interviews. You can see some of them online in places like YouTube. For the hell she went through after Hollywood, she aged gracefully, still had a strong voice, and, contrary to Paramount's opinion, it was excellent for film. Ooh, take that. From here on, things are easier. Louise travels to Europe again for the first time in 30 years. Partly because it was Frenchmen who had hollered enough about her films in order to resurrect her. However, she was still as pugnacious then as she was when she told Paramount to F off and left to go film with Pabst. Many people wanted her to write her memoirs. She told many of them exactly what she had told Paramount. Because she didn't like the trend or style of ghost-written sleep-and-tell books. Louise never did write a memoir, though you can find her essays bundled into a book called Lulu in Hollywood. As she aged, her mind remained sharp. The same cannot be said for her body. By 1980, she had terrible breathing, probably because of smoking. Louise had also had enough of this late cult following and tended to trash her own fans. 
That said, at 70-something years old, I'd also be annoyed at people turning up on my doorstep in the middle of the night during a thunderstorm. Did that really happen? Yes, this random late teens French woman showed up Those on her doorstep. French. I love it. It's, it's like the, um, you know, in the YouTube comments of every musician where it's like, come to Brazil, um, but for French people, for Louise Brooks. It's, I bet that was a really confusing feeling for her because on the one hand, these were the people who had kind of supported her and um, kind of given her back the stardom of her youth. But on the other hand, creepy. It reminds me of the women who would fall down with bouquets at Natalie Barney's doorstep when she was old because they mm-hmm. discovered her, too. Right. It's like, I'm sure that's very flattering. And, and it's beautiful to see that you are recognized and that people understood what you were going for. But on the other hand, you're you're a person. Yes. Fans of this podcast, I would be flattered if you did this, but also please don't. <laughs> now, Louise also at times muttered about disliking being so fawned over by the gay community. Ooh, does the biphobia rear its ugly head again? In this case, it was uh, not helped by lingering paranoia over various things like believing Vanity Fair blacklisted her for 40 years after she went to an ad for them. So I wonder about paranoia being involved here. Either way, a complicated woman. A recluse for the last two years of her life, and stuck with weakening bone condition. Louise thought she was hanging on too long, and was just waiting for the Grim Reaper to appear. He showed up fashionably late. She died of a heart attack in her apartment on August 8th, 1985, at the age of 78. In Europe, it was a front-page obit. In the U.S., it was a footnote in the death section. Louise was then cremated and buried in Rochester's Holy Sepulchre Cemetery. When it comes to epitaphs and final words, some have suggested to be a rebel is to court extinction. Others have called her the only unrepentant hedonist, the only pure pleasure seeker they've ever known. And then there is what Louise herself wrote. I have been taking stock of my 50 years since I left Wichita in 1922 at the age of 15 to become a dancer with Ruth St. Dennis and Ted Sean. How I have existed fills me with horror, for I failed in everything. Spelling, arithmetic, writing, swimming, tennis, golf, dancing, singing, acting, wife, mistress, whore, friend, even cooking. And I do not excuse myself with the usual escape of not trying. I tried with all my heart. Okay, first of all, that is devastating, but second of all, patently untrue. I mean, with some of those, at least, she, like, did very much succeed in the film industry. She succeeded at dancing. It just happened that she didn't succeed for the entirety of her life, and no one can do that. And on that note, thanks for listening. For more episodes, follow us on your favorite podcatcher or subscribe to us on YouTube. We're still on Twitter. I refuse to call it X. Posting jokes and memes about your favorite historical women for as long as the site stays up, though I am thinking about Tumblr now. Do a Tumblr, do a Mastodon, do a Blue Sky, whatever you can get your hands on. And remember, even if your career has died, there's always the chance the French will resurrect it.